text folks. Um, uh, and that I think would be valuable for you to think about when you're designing in the future, especially around urban kitchen streams like she was describing. All right, today um, I'm really happy to have Adina Maryland here. She's an extension specialist uh, uh, at the University of California, uh, Berkeley. She's in the Environmental Science Policy and Management Department. You're actually housed at Hoffman? I am. Okay. Uh, yeah, she's an internationally recognized conservation bio biologist working on the environmental problem solving at the landscape scale. Uh, well published over 70 scientific research articles focusing on the relationships between land use and biodiversity. And she co-authored the only comprehensive book on wildlife corridor planning called Corridor Ecology, the Science and Practice of Linking Landscapes for Biodiversity and Conservation. Over the past 15 years, she's trained graduate students as well as worked with decision makers to couple conservation and land use planning using spatially explicit decision support systems. She's going to present a, a, a talk that I saw uh, last August, I guess, uh, in Sacramento at a conference focusing on um, California urbanization and impacts on the water. So, you know. Good. Um, well, thank you, Lars. Hi, great to be here. So we're having like, a really hot fall. I was like, ah, uh, Davis is going to be fine. It's already be October, and it's Friday. Heat shock. Um, this way, I love Lars. Very tech savvy. I like the way the notes were in his iPhone, and he's got this radio uh, advancer, so I can even like point it at you guys, and it should advance. Let's see if that works. So today I'm actually going to talk about um, something you probably all know a lot about and you're actually experiencing yourself. So it should resonate, if not already be something that you know. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how the changes in our population um, relate to consequences for uh, wildlife in this case. I do actually work a little bit on water and agricultural ecosystems and obviously land use and water use are coupled. I'm not going to talk anything about our hydrologic work, but please do look our website up. Um, we have a lot of papers on that as well, more in the agricultural landscape. Um, so this talks to me a little bit on what we're experiencing as a, as, as a population across the state and what the consequences are for species and for habitat and for stream habitat. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and there is an R at the end of my name, so it's Adina Marin Lender. I cut it off there. Um, if you want to look at the website, and all of our papers are linked PDFs under publications. And stuff. Should be easy. Uh, does it work? Look at that. I pointed at you guys. And... <laughs> all right. Um, the content of this presentation basically is going to cover these issues related to population, and all of this data has been uh, the estimates of what's happening with California's population has been developed mostly by the state and by um, the Public Policy Institute and by some UC researchers. So I'm going to be sort of giving a comprehensive overview, a very big sort of flyover picture of what the experts in California think that the California population is going to be like in the near term. <coughs> Um, and I'm going to talk about also some build-out models that have been done statewide to give us an idea of where this population is going to go. So where, how much additional population are we talking about? What is the population going to look like age-wise? Um, and where are they going to be? How is that going to relate to uh, land use change as far as development problems? And then again, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the consequences for uh, natural resources, and have hopefully a discussion, a few minutes discussion, what, what you guys think we should be doing differently, some ideas that these folks have come up with, some ideas I've come up with, a growing list of to do with items. All right, so we can look at population graphs that look like this. These are just basically the estimated millions of people that are going to be in California. Um, right now we're at 36.8, about million people in California. And we can keep growing. We can say, okay, we know that by 2020 we're going to be 40, probably 42. That's just 10 years from now. And you can look at the chart and say, okay, so the experts are saying, you know, by the time we get to 2050, we're going to be somewhere between 50 and 70 million. 50 is the low end, 70 million is the high end. What does that really mean? Does that resonate with you? Are you running out of the room with your hair on fire? Probably not. You're going blue. Okay, she came all the way to tell us that these blue 
triangles are increasing. What does that really mean? Okay, that means in 15 years. That's the amount of time that I've already been working for the University of California. We're going to add the number of people that live in New York. Anybody been to New York lately? There's a lot of people. Luckily, they will all be New Yorkers. <laughs> and by the time my kids, who are running around being in sixth grade right now, and everybody tells me it all goes very quickly as a parent, but by the time my kids are my age, we're going to have all those people who live in New York, plus we're going to have all the people that live in Texas. Anybody ever been to Texas? Dallas, Houston, and every other little township. All of those people are living there, and all the number of people are living here, not those same people, obviously, are going to be with us on our highways, in our schools. That's the kind of numbers we're talking about. Is that really possible unless you build up? Well, we're going to talk about how we build and how we accommodate that. But those are the projections. All right. What is the demography going to look like? The age structure is when we think about this a little bit. So today, I fall in here. Believe it or not, I'm just about to exit the red and join the blue. Um, but we still consider my age group fairly productive. Not nearly as productive as you all are, but you know we're still producing in the economy and we're running around pretty active, right? And there's a lot of folks like me, right? Um, in the year 2030, right, I will be in great company in my age group. In fact, one in every four people will be uh, in their six year old. Right? So hopefully we'll still be a little bit productive, but not nearly as productive as we are now. And that means that every time I walk by the street, one in four, we're rocking on, we're in the gray. You know, <laughs> right? That's a lot of greater people. Of course, almost everyone dyes their hair, except for me, so you won't recognize <laughs> us, but we probably won't be as productive as you will, right? Okay, one in four will be 60 by 2030. Um, this is a projection that I find really interesting. 30% of the people will be four and more, and that's sort of hard for me to believe, but there's one thing that is clear. We're gonna have a lot of newcomers, no matter how you slice this pie. And in particular, like, this is going to be driven by one clear and sad fact. Right now, one in every four youth are not graduating from high school. And by the time we hit 2030, only 30% of these productive young people are going to be college graduates. I just hope you're in that group. Because we're going to have a lot of jobs that require a college education and more. And where are we going to get those people? They predict that we're going to get them by foreign born and outside California. In fact, now we populate a huge number of our high qualification jobs by people who went to college outside California. What does that mean for our growth? We're growing like crazy, and we need to import all this talent. So it's a double up, no matter how you slice it. All right. Next question, where? We might want to dim the lights on some of these where slides. I don't know what our, our lighting options are here. Maybe the back on and the front off for this slide. That would be good, and then keep the back. Is that good for you guys? A little bit better on the lighting? Okay, good. Because these maps, when you get into these GIS figures, it's nice to be able to see them. <clears throat> All right, so where will the growth occur? Um, what this is basically doing is it's the Department of Finance's 2007 report, and it's giving us a map. Shakes along. Um, oh, it's the fan. Uh, the darker the purple, the higher the density of new people. Okay, so this is density change, number of people per square mile, added to that square mile by 2050. Okay, so we're talking about 40 years from now, how many more people will be in a square mile? Now, as you might expect, I'm sure you all figured out, they're all going to be in Southern California. It's cool. We'll just stay up here. <laughs> well, that's true. A lot. In fact, some, some cells in Southern California are going to get more than 1,000 and sometimes up to 1,700 additional people per square mile. Forget your car. 
you know, you guys don't have to worry. You're on your bike and you're in Northern California now. But you can forget your car as far as I'm concerned. If you added a thousand more people to every square mile. All right. Up in Northern California, what I think is really interesting about this figure is that in a lot of these areas, and I'll show you some other bar charts to explain this, in a lot of these light purple areas, we're still going to double the number of people per square mile because these are really low density places. So it's sort of like, it's all going to matter, right? If you're already in a really high density place, you're going to get higher density. But you may also have infrastructure for higher density. If you're in a low density place in California, you're still going to double, which could really shock some of our low density communities right now as far as gearing up for that kind of doubling. Oh, I didn't show you, but this is the uh, Bay Area. I didn't talk about it, but it's here. So here we are um, going up to 2050, but as you can't see in the back, the end of this grand, this end of this chart is at 2050. And this is the Bay Area people in millions going up over time. So this is 2000 to 2050, this last block. There's the Bay Area counties and the surrounding 12 counties. You guys are in the surrounding area. So lots of people, even in what you consider not being the darkest of purple. This kind of gets at it too. These highlighted counties, San Diego County, San Bernardino, Riverside, Fresno. So I want to point first about this, the Southern California areas. Yes, we're expecting huge amounts of growth. Here we are in yellow. We're going to go to 2025 in blue and, two, and 2100 in red. This is based on um, a quote of John Landis did some urban modeling for all of California and where the growth was going to occur based on a, a statistical build-out model. And so we're going to see these big bars and this more than doubling effect in Southern California. And then, not surprisingly, we have quite a bit of growth in our Central Valley communities. Um, so you didn't come to UC just to hear the facts from the book. You came to UC to figure out what's wrong with the stated facts in the book. And what I want to say here is what's really interesting is, is this really going to happen in the Central Valley? Yes, our birth rates are higher in the Central Valley. But what about climate change? Is it going to be possible to grow, uh, I guess, grapes and raisins, table grapes and raisins, almonds and other things in the southern central valley with climate change? Will there be the jobs to hold those populations? So I think we really have to question, while we can extrapolate the trends that we see now and tell you how these counties are likely to go based on birth rates and immigration rates to these areas, we do have to question, you know, what's it going to be like? Will, the, will people stay or will people be fleeing? Because we really can't grow those crops anymore. You can't have that kind of economy, which that past trend, growth trend, has, has uh, subsisted. And um, the other point, while the magnitude of these bars is not as great, you, think, you know, okay, so they're only going to get 1.5 million in Santa Barbara County or Monterey, some of these Central Coast, Stanislaus, some of these Sierra Foothill counties. Again, they're still going to more than double. So that doesn't mean that the county planners, you know, when they look at 2100 numbers for the Stanislaus County, they're just kicking back and going, no problem here, right? All right. And the urbanized footprint. Um, more interesting is probably to look at the maps of future urbanized footprints. And basically what you're seeing here is some landis modeling that John has did, and I think I picked it up by uh, folks down in Redlands, um, where Esri is located, the guys that run these GIS maps, or uh, well, the software that generates them. And what we're seeing here is forecasted urban expansion out here in Riverside County. So just focus on these dark orange areas to the east part of of Orange, east side of Orange County in central Riverside County. And notice what's probably going to be happening is what we've seen a lot is these cities, San Bernardino, this whole area is going to expand to south, this area is going to expand a little bit to north, so we'll probably see some, you know, merging into bigger, bigger sort of mega cities. But this whole view of urban development and what's going to happen in urban areas really oversimplifies the issues that we're concerned about with regard to natural resources. Because while we're going to require all of these additional services and things, um, it's important that we think about what's going to go on outside our urban footprint. So one of the things that's interesting is it's not 
as you pointed out when you raised your hand, it's not just that we're going to grow, but how we're going to grow influences everything about how our how we're going to use our natural resources and how resource limited are we going to be? How water limited are we going to be? How land limited are we going to be? How uh, transportation vehicle miles hours are we going to be? You know, how is it really going to influence uh, our livelihoods? Depends on how we grow. And this study was very interesting in that this John Lamb study because they did this infill exercise. I really like this work. You go to the California infill study. It was funded by Governor Schwarzenegger. And what I thought was so interesting about it is they estimate where in these cities, in these urban footprints, can they handle infill. That means additional development inside the urban service boundary. Actually, it's um, assuming, and in his case, infill is not perfectly defined as upgrade the building and then add additional housing. But in his case, he doesn't use that word correctly, as far as I understand my language spanners. But what he uses, John Landis uses when he says infill, is the assumption that you're going to actually upgrade some of these available building places. In other words, so it's, now it's a three-story, six-unit building. He estimates how a, a much additional capacity the building will be, assuming you build the building height, right? Big. Um, I can talk later for those who have questions about how he does this, because I think it was a really creative exercise and amazing that he was able to estimate these for the whole state of California. But anyway, he runs these models and he looks at the estimates based on economic valuation of the property as to whether it can handle additional development, that is mostly additional housing. And then he allocates that housing. So he says, we have this much growth, how much can we allocate to inside the service boundary? Um, and what he shows is that basically if we allocate um, the key point on the slide, if we allocate 10% of those additional numbers of people that are going to be in California to um, infill, to inside service boundaries, then he estimates that the conversion from of sort of wildlands or wildland urban interface lands outside service areas where we have a lot of natural resources, woodlands, forest lands, grasslands, watersheds that we rely on, um, we'll lose 5.1 million acres of that. But if we bump the infill, in other words, we accommodate 30% of the expected population growth inside our city center, then we can reduce that by half. So it really demonstrates, I mean, there's sure, there's error on all of these models, but I think the point here is that it demonstrates that you could potentially, by just bumping up 20% more population into inside service boundaries, you reduce you know, the estimates of reducing land consumption of undeveloped land by half. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, we'll need to even do more than that, and that will require a lot of policy changes. Even to get to 30%, they read a nice report about how policy would really have to radically change to get to even to 30. All right, so I mentioned that it's not just urban expansion, it's ex-urban expansion. And that's the really nice thing about people here at UC Davis. Bob Johnston uh, was transportation planner uh, over in environmental studies, environmental science. <laughs> that department has changed names, I think, a few times. Um, started a program uh, to, to address exurban development, and he wrote a model. This is not it. He wrote a model called U Plan that addresses exurban development. The other person who's tried, who has made a lot of inroads in addressing exurban development, is David Theobald. And what we're looking at here is a little graphic that David Theobald put together to show just basically census blocks and how they're likely to change over time. So what I want you to focus on is not what we've been talking about so far, which is these red areas. Yes, hopefully we're going to have info. And unfortunately, these cities are probably going to start to merge, as you see in this red. There's good evidence of that. But what's shocking about this picture is going to 2050 with it and looking at the yellow areas. Because that's all of our rural land that supply the resources we're so dependent on, ecosystem services that we're so dependent on. And will really change quite, it will change the face of California, literally. And so David Theobald has demonstrated, I think, in this picture that we really have to be paying attention to growth outside the city, not just inside. And it requires a bigger modeling effort. And thank goodness people here like Jim Thorne and 
McCoy and Jim Quinn and Justin Weinerbugel and following in a tradition of Bob Johnson and others are really taking this on because it's more complex. It's a lot easier to figure out what's going to happen with these red areas. It's really hard. I mean, it's easy for David Duval to just blimp out <coughs> into yellow, but to actually see the real pattern that of, of what we are expecting on those urban land, I mean, on those rural landscapes is really hard. The rules that planners use are not in stone out there. The constraints are not as obvious as to where where you cannot go because you can put your own well, your own septic system um, anywhere. Uh, the zoning is more in flux. The counties are sometimes uh, more susceptible to, to changes by for economic pressures and things like that. So predicting these patterns becomes much more difficult. Um, so I think I beat that or it's pretty dead, and this slide kind of does it again. But I just this is uh, another one of these urban build-out models uh, for Riverside County. We just see urban growth. Oh, sorry, for um, this is sort of Los Angeles, San Bernardino borderlands, and you're just seeing a lot of urban growth going emerging. All right, real case study of what this means, at least from my little lens of the world. I work in Sonoma County quite a bit. Sometimes the surrounds of Sonoma. Anybody from Sonoma County here? Sort of been there, hung out there. Okay, good. Um, it, if you get off on the Golden Gate Bridge, and you, if you take the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco, and you keep driving north uh, about an hour on the 101, you don't have to change roads or anything, just take the bridge, keep going, and you will run into Sonoma County. Um, Right here, we're seeing Sonoma County, and the main road that goes through it is the Highway 101. And if you want to come over to Davis, you hook over here in these Baylands to 37. And the point of this slide is that this is a model we used as an early version of, well, we, we made quite a bit of revisions to an early version of this um, program called U-Plan. Um, and what we did was it helped us to build out our expected population growth in Sonoma County. And this is the build out. These areas in red are where we're expecting additional high density development, these little red areas. Now, if you're a conservation biologist like, like I am, and you just have this slide to go on, you could just protect. You're done. Because it's not that much land, so you can soon. I mean, I'm not like losing sleep over those red polygons, right? That are going to get more development. But I am losing sleep over this. And this is the demand we have and the accommodation. We can accommodate a huge amount under our current policies of exurban development. So additionally splitting. And actually, this particular model, um, I kind of take that back because I was talking about U-Plan, but I was showing you a model run from a parcel level uh, regression model. So this is a parcel level regression model based on empirical data. And here, this is also based on empirical data that David Newberg did. And what we're seeing here, nonetheless, same point, is that all of these bluer areas have a much higher probability of going into exurban development. But the point is, the geographic extent of the area is far greater. Right? So one is this consolidated little footprint, and the other is like sprawling everywhere. What does sprawling everywhere mean on the landscape? Like from a bird's perspective or a rabbit running by, right? I mean, we can say that we're gonna have a lot more houses in our rural landscape. But we don't totally understand what does a lot more houses in the rural landscape actually mean? Whether you're a land, maybe you're a landscape architect. Probably not gonna make your living doing landscape architecture out in the rural setting. Maybe, there's a lot of these big mansions and they like, architectural design, things like that. But, um, but we don't really think about, we don't design very often or think about the design, we're only starting to, of these rural communities. We're starting to think about conservation development, it's called conservation development, where we make trades and we try to cluster these houses somewhere here and try to organize this kind of development. But up until fairly recently, this has been somewhat of a willy-nilly pattern of living in the countryside. Not been a lot of design employed. 
from a planning perspective or a landscape perspective. Um, and so Kristen Beard, a postdoc who's in my lab who now works for USGS, did this nice little analysis where we actually use this object recognition uh, software that helps us to identify readily and automatically where we have pavement and um, the built environment. And this is, a, this is actually in the Lassen Foothills, a typical ex-urban developed neighborhood. These are very large lot sizes, some are 10 acres, 20 acres. And what we wanted to know is, when someone plops their footprint down on a 20 to 40 acre lot, what does that actually mean as far as how much impervious surface, how big is the home, how big are the outbuildings? What is the impact? Just physically first. And then, of course, as conservation biologists, I'll talk about what it means ecologically. Um, and so this was one of the first analyses where we actually quantify for many, many, many ex-urban residences what these footprints look like, and then we did some modeling to see if you were to um, expand this kind of land use, what would it mean for other areas? Okay. All right. um, now I'll talk about U-Plan. So before, those are parcel level map. These are actually our U-Plan model runs, so we're not fine this time. And um, Sonoma County again. And the point of this graphic is just to show that um, you can use build out analysis very effectively to work with planners to show them the consequences of the choices that we have. Because remember what you were saying it's not if we're going to grow, it's how we're going to grow. Are we going to do consolidated growth with all the expected capacity being accommodated to these little green blocks here? And higher density areas and only let a little bit of suburban, suburb, I guess you kind of call it low density. It's, it's medium density residential, it's still on the services. Um, and get this kind of footprint of future growth. Or what we did here is we talked to the planners and we said, if you were to change, if, if changes happen to the general plan, if you break the general plan, what changes do you usually allow? And the planners are like, well, if it's an agricultural piece of land that's 40 acres or less, we probably would be more willing to let that go to housing and split it up than we would a larger agricultural house. So we ran a scenario. We said, well, if you hold your general plan, you don't make any changes, you won't be able to accommodate all the demand for growth in Sonoma County. There'll be lots of people who will go somewhere else and look for housing. If you do do the break that you think is probably likely or you're very more willing to allow, then we're going to develop some of our prime farmland in the valley bottoms, which are close to cities. We're going to sprawl out a little bit more and accommodate more development. We're going to have a lower, what we call a deficit when we work with you plan. So it's like, we're going to accommodate more expected growth and fewer people will have to go elsewhere. If you don't use the general plan at all, you just let everyone kind of sprawl out there in this sort of no plan scenario, you potentially have lots and lots of available rural land subdivision opportunities that would allow people to just kind of spatter out across the landscape, uh, resulting in somewhat the worst case scenario for habitat conservation. Aren't those green belts? Southern County's hillsides between towns, aren't those all green belts? Yeah, there are, there are green belts. Um, there's no regulatory regulations associated with green belts. They're designated green belts. But they're they're voted. Yeah, they're designated mm -hmm. as green belts. Right. But there's no policy mechanism to prevent development. So go by the owner wanting to sell the owners. Sell. If there's permitted, um, if they are not what we call it zone capacity, which means right. that if let's right. say you own a 20 acre lot and you are zoned in 10 acre lots, right. you would be allowed to split to two tenants. Well, even though you're in a scenic, I don't care what the <laughs> lovely name is, they gave it. However, fortunately, Sonoma County does have an open space district. It's very active, oh, and, right. you know, so they have uh, a carrot. Mm -hmm. They don't have that many sticks. Yeah, there's a little house here and a little house there sometimes on the hillside. Yeah, yeah, but they have a lot of demand for more rural residential. Absolutely. Yeah. And senior housing. Yeah, more high density senior housing. Yeah. 
All right. Um, what's the question? All right. Okay, so let's just quickly cover two slides on habitat <laughs> and birds. I think two or three slides, and then we're going to open it up for solution sets. By all of that. What does land use change mean for habitat loss, fragmentation, biodiversity, water resources? Okay. All of these things are important. Obviously, I'd be here for like three days if we were to cover them all. And lots of people work on all of them. So I'm just going to give you a little smattering from my own lab. Um, but this, this is something that a lot of us work on. Almost, I mean, many of us in environmental science, in conservation biology, and ecology work on these issues. What it's really trying to get at is can we find patterns and potentially even causal relationships between land use and the consequences to these resources? And if we can quantify those relationships, then we try sometimes to extrapolate that beyond where we quantify it. So we may quantify it in one or two watersheds, in a couple of streams, a couple of bird counts, and then we use that information through modeling to try to say that this, to try to extrapolate as best we can across a much larger area and get some kind of picture of what the future for the birds, the salmon, and things like that look like. And we take advantage of running these scenarios to say what does it look like for if we do the sprawl pattern, the condensed pattern, on these other resources. So here's an example. We did a nice little study um, looking at bird counts. Uh, this is a suite of birds that we call urban avoiders. They're species that have been shown through other studies in California, in the Sierra Foothills, and the Central Coast, and in the um, Bay Area that uh, are really preferentially found in wildlands, in natural areas. And when we look at those, um, the whole suite of them, what we showed is we sampled these sites that are undeveloped, their ownerships are greater than 250 acres. And then we looked at areas that we define as exurban, those are those 10 to 40 lots on their own septic and their own sewer, they're not, they're not services, they're not served by urban services. And then we looked at the suburban, these are um, one acre lots and smaller, kind of on the city edge, so there's still really a lot of oaks and I mean, purposefully we chose sites that whatever class they fell in, they are pretty, for that class, they're very wildlife friendly. We're talking about lots of natural habitat, a lovely place to be. Um, and we see that something interesting. One, the major question is, is does ex-urban areas, those low density housing that we're so worried about, for birds that don't want to be in the city, we already know they're urban avoiders, are they ex-urban avoiders? And this is probably the most shocking result of this paper. They're really darn close to, or they really see exurban really closely the way they see suburban. And it's really low numbers and higher in undeveloped. And particularly for things like cotton vario, orange from rubber, which are in this data set, we see that same effect. That they are responding similarly in their abundances in exurban sites as suburban sites. In other words, we statistically, and it's just a sample, cannot tell the difference if we were in an exurban or suburban with the counts. But you can see there's, and I'll take a question in the back in a minute, you can see there's a huge amount of variance, obviously. Yeah, there's a lot of other factors that influence the bird counts, like um, the tree structure, uh, nearest, how close you are to riparian <coughs> communities, and other things besides your development density. Question back. What's the uh, y-axis for those numbers? Yeah, these are numbers of counts. So it's a relative proportion of how many counts per sort of J. But basically, it's a uh, relative proportion of counts. So it's not, um, you know, we take the count data and we put it into an abundance metric just to look at the number of counts per. All right. Um, another study with similar purpose. Basically, how, what is the causal relationship of land use on, in this case, stream habitat? And one of the things that was interesting about this, again, the purpose of the study was, are we able to detect the difference between exurban land use and suburban land use on in-stream habitat. So is it different 
the exurb and footprint for land for its effects on in-stream, or is it behaving again just like a suburb? In this case, it's really clear that the exurban areas are not behaving just like suburban areas, just like urban areas. What we see, and this has been demonstrated not just by us but other people, is when we look at the amount of sediment that's found in pools that are downstream from watersheds, um, we find that preferred habitat, of course, is without a lot of sediment. Fish can survive better in these clear gravel spawning areas lower dissolved oxygen and um, looser gravel for spawning. And if don't survive so well, the eggs don't mature, and there's a lot of problems with dissolved oxygen in highly sediment in, in, in systems that have a lot of sediment. So we use fishing game data that ranks this one to five, so good to poor habitat. And what we see is what you might expect. The problem with detecting lower sediment pools, in other words, clear and clean pools, dramatically drops off as you add the percent of urban development in the watershed. So we have a very steep marginal effect. As you add increased percent of urban development, you dramatically drop the um, probability of finding the class one pools that are really nice and clear. And this is consistent with a lot of people who've done this in other parts of the country in the Northwest where quite a lot of work's been done on sediment pools and forestry. Where they say basically you start getting over 5% urban, you really get a big bump up in the sediment industry. Um, so the, the missing factor was what does it mean to be in a low density exurban mansionette kind of watershed? so much of what we see across our Sierra foothills, so much of what we see in Sonoma County. Is that a problem for these pools? We see <coughs> that you can really have quite an extensive amount of exurban development and just decline slightly as far as sediment. But what was really interesting was when we, I don't know if I put the slide for you. Um, so one might think, oh, urban, really big effect, exurban, gradual effect, as you'd seen previously. But what was really interesting to us is when we did our build-out models, remember those blue pictures of Sonoma County? Because we're going to get so much more exurban development, the geographic extent of expected change in exurban development is so much greater than we get. Remember the tiny little, oops, remember the tiny little red areas in Sonoma County that I said I wasn't really that worried about? Because we're just not going to go up even 1%. But we're going to be way, way out here in exurban development. Because one house covers such a large area that you quickly get this huge amount of land cover that's in exurban. So it turns out that the expected amount of degradation in the creeks in our watersheds that we looked at in Sonoma County is going to come from exurban, even though the marginal effect is that makes sense? So it's like, if you make a lot of it, then even though each little incremental unit isn't adding a lot, you end up with a magnitude that's greater. Um, following up, just so you can follow up, for those who are really interested in this work, it was done by Kathleen Losey at my, as a postdoc in my lab, and it's available on our website, um, and it was published in Ecological Applications. And, uh, I should check the question about the y-axis on the counts um, scale, but this is also a land use and urban planning. It's a recent 2010, maybe not. Um, all right, so both papers are available, and there's a lot, obviously, more to them. And I'm sharing this a little Let's talk about what we're going to do. Let's spell everything <laughs> in the bright sun out in the yard. <laughs> That's what happened there. Um, I don't teach you not to edit your slides in the bright sun outside the garden. All right. Um, but this is a list I actually pasted in from, um, from a paper that was done by a group of A&R researchers developing a strategic plan for the state, for the university. And they came up with some of these, and I thought I'd paste those in to get started as far as what some of our challenges are. 
and have you guys mention ones that aren't up here. So um, a lot of people argue that planning needs to be done on a larger scale, that we need to coordinate our planning, not just local county planning. Um, obviously, we've beat down this whole issue of you know rural squaw. We don't need to go over that. Um, People here have been really great about working in coordinated public transport and land use, working with Caltrans and other transportation planners. Um, this seems sort of pie in the sky, not very concrete. Uh, somebody in the audience already mentioned affordable housing, retirement housing. Those kinds of things are really important to this equation of how we're going to grow. Um, what's not on this list? <coughs> These UC researchers aren't that good. <laughs> uh, habitat. Yeah, that's a great one. We have these huge challenges in habitat. How are we going to maintain the, the quality of our habitat? How are we going to manage our habitat? How are we going to connect our landscapes and make sure that whatever fragments we have left are really functioning as best as we can? I kind of think there's a major one that I talked about when I first walked in this room. Sounds some previous stuff. What did I complain about coming to Davis? Climate change. Climate change. Climate change is making right? So we have a huge effort in the state. It's not like we're ignoring it, but that you know we need to be thinking about climate change adaptation. What if all these patterns and trends and models and everything are just not really reflecting our future climate realities? And hence, those people aren't really living for us. Well, like I said, they're all going to be on the Mendocino Coast, and you know issues could be very huge. Or maybe they're not going to be in Santa Barbara because they're like flood water, you know, the water's going to be a little bit, sea level rise, and yeah, 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 you know, and Long Beach Harbor is actually not really going to work very well anymore. We all know the Bay Delta is going to be all salty. And so, you know, of those things, like if suddenly you turn on the tap and the water is salt water, you, you know, it may not stick around. I'll pick up another slide. You guys could do better on this one. Okay, this is where you come into play, because remember, I'm getting into my daughtering old age. <laughs> I'm not going to be doing that much more action. We all hope you guys are. So, um, I'm big on this one. I think that conservation biologists and land use planners need to work more together, and I try to do that by writing papers to land use planners about how we need to do more of that. Um, uh, that has to do more with the university, sorry, but you know, we need to work with our county plan. Um, many of you are working on scenarios in the state, for the counties. Um, I'm big on this one. It's a program I'm starting to try to improve science literacy. So we need to do a lot of work as educators, right? All those kids and all those young adults who don't have a lot of science literacy, how are they going to contribute to these decisions? What are you guys going to do? Five minutes, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> In addition to educating... Stand up and say that. Oh, I'm just wondering, if in addition to educating the, uh, the children of the state, can we also educate policymakers and politicians with our, with our efforts? Statistically, it's pretty hard to hear that there's not many graduates. I know the, the college level, they're, they're down. So it would be to graduate. And then um, I have my question, and maybe others have it too, is, is uh, if there are no jobs, maybe people will get educated. You here? Maybe, maybe people will get educated, and then we won't hire out of state or out of country. Because I know with like um, Obamacare, there aren't enough doctors for the population as it is. So it makes you wonder if we're going to employ out of country or educate out of country in the country and then hopefully retain those employees in the future. Um, so I guess that's my question and answer. Graduate from school.
just presenting you with this huge crisis. Uh, for all of you who are in this room to attend the Society for Conservation Biology conference that is going to be an international conference that's going to be happening in Oakland here in about 18 months. And so if you're a planner and you want to try to figure out how can I uh, bring my landscape architecture or my planning focus into an informed, uh, inform myself and, then, and maybe get inspired to work with other people, I suggest that you try going to this conference. Uh, Dina can tell you a little bit about Yeah, and Davis has a really great chapter of conservation biologists. And I think that if you really do, we need to melt these departments, literally. I mean, I was in Australia helping them figure out whether, how they can make their landscape architecture and planning department relate better to their environmental science department and vice versa. We have some work to do in academia and in our own professional development. Joining societies and crossing over is great. So who of you landscape architect uh, students know about the departmental merger that's going on right now? Who knows about that? So what's going? What's what's happening? Tell, tell us what's happening. Basically, as part of the um, budget uh, difficulties, the department had to consolidate with three other departments in order to survive. And which ones are those? That is uh, the community development, the um, human, uh, what is it, human development? Yes. And there's an economic one as well. Yeah, so the, the actual three departments that are merging are environmental design, which is our department, human development, and community development. So those three are actually going to form into another department. The, the administrative cluster is the environmental science and policy and ag econ. So we're going to be an administrative cluster, but we're, we're the, this new department, the proposed name for this new department is Human Community Development and Design. So they're, they're all going to, we're all going to be in the same room together. So we're doing what you're doing. It, it's good. I think it's really good. It's, you know, nobody likes change, but this, I think this is pretty exciting. Do the degrees stay the same? Yeah, that's something that's being discussed. The, the degree programs will, be, will will stay the same for for a while. There's going to be changes. What does cheddar stand for? What does cheddar? <laughs> I don't know what that is. It's, uh, it's an acronym for the same thing. Okay. Somebody clever came up with it. Okay. Okay. So that's what you mean by the um, College of Environmental and uh, Sciences, the separate mm -hmm. university of Davis, you're saying now is, is administrative? No, no, no. The college, we're in the College of uh, Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. Right. The three departments, environmental design, community development, human development, are merging into a single department. Within that, within that, yes. environmental. I might just note that it's interesting that that's emerging out of a financial crisis because actually what's been discussed is that a lot of these departments actually need to work together. I mean, you know, you yeah. touched on, on all of those issues because really, you know, uh, human development, community development, and climate change are integral in the planning. So, you know, perhaps it's actually really a positive thing for planning in California you know, and in research. So. Yeah. Well, I hope whatever path you end up on, that you're successful at it, and hopefully can help us to change in a way that at least minimizes the damage to the fragile natural resources that we all really depend on, and that we all love and enjoy. I mean, we want to keep enjoying living in California. Um, and so you know, hopefully we can work together to make it still a sustainable, enjoyable experience. And yeah, sustainable. So this, Adina's uh, seminar kind of ends this first part of this, some, this uh, quarter's uh, presentations on the challenges. What are the challenges that you as the, the new uh, policy or the movers and shakers of the state, what are you going to be challenged with? So the following pro uh, presentations are more towards, here's some uh, solutions, some possible solutions. So, some things that people are doing now to address our challenges. So uh, hopefully that uh, 
beginning next week, you'll see a change in the, the type of topics. Okay? Sorry to miss it. Enjoy. <laughs> All right, thank you.